Okay, let's move on now to our uh, third speaker, who's Jürgen Schmidhuber. Um, Jürgen is um, an AI researcher who is director of the Swiss AI Lab in Lugano, very well known for his work over the years on, on deep neural networks, or recurrent neural networks, deep neural networks of all kinds, it's where he's been a pioneer since, I guess, the, uh, the early 90s. Um, he's also done some really interesting work on universal AI, including designing the wonderful Gödel machines, which are you know, provably more powerful than all kinds of uh, other uh, AI systems and unfortunately not fully implemented just yet. But um, <laughs> over to you, Jürgen. Thanks so much, David. First, I had no idea what I, I'm going to talk about, but now I can just respond to, um, to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> talk about last minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me briefly explain how we already have little conscious um, artificial systems in our lab and have had them for a couple of years. And, um, and in those systems, um, consciousness is just a natural side effect, a byproduct of data compression during problem solving. Why that? So to build a general problem solver, that is what um, we have been working on for many decades and we are getting closer and closer. You need something like a general purpose computer, which in our case usually is a, is a recurrent neural network because in this universe you want to have um, a computational device which uh, exploits the physical um, uh, constraints as much as possible. So that you want to have lots of processors in a, in a small volume connected through many short wires and few long wires to minimize communication costs. So you have a, a problem solver where video streams in and pain signals and, and auditory signals and whatever, and it <coughs> translates that somehow into movements, action sequences, and um, it gets reward positive um, signals, feedback signals, for achieving goals. So there's some utility function that it wants to maximize that, or you give it one goal after another, and then over time it becomes a, a more general problem solver. Now this guy has a little helper, which is another recurrent neural network, which is a model of the world. And what does it do? It takes all the data ever observed, all the inputs that uh, ever were obse observed in response to the actions that were generated by the control module. The controller and the model, they interact in a certain sense, and the, the control is shaping the history of uh, inputs coming in, um, uh, which, which then the model tries to predict, to compress through predictive coding. Why does it want to do that? Because it wants to figure out a few regular things in the world. Now, we have a very friendly environment and lots of things are repetitive and repeat themselves. And so you can, this means always that you can, you can more compactly um, describe them in, by, by devising a little program, a little recurrent sub-network, which can encode these things through predictive coding, for example. So you, for example, have videos of falling apples, a hundred apples fall down like this, and then the raw data is like that. But if you understand gravity, you have a little recurrent network which implements the predictions according to gravity, then you can predict how these apples come down and you can greatly, greatly compress the video. And all of physics and all of science and all of chemistry is really about compression progress, about finding short descriptions of the data, which you then often can reuse um, uh, through the controller to solve problems better. Now, what is this um, unsupervised module doing, which is doing the compression of all the data ever observed in response to all your actions ever executed? So you, you better store them all. We don't know whether humans store them all, but uh, a robot should store them all uh, because storage is cheap, and you can easily store 100 years of high-resolution video um, in, in, in current uh, devices, and then you um, you want to find the regularities during sleep, for example, you work on all this data and you try to compress, basically. Which means that all the things that frequently occur in your environment, such as faces, for example, um, are efficiently encoded in some sort of prototype phase. So a new phase comes along such that you have to encode only the deviations from the prototype phase that you already have. Same for glasses, same for everything that is um, happening in your world, the words, the repet repetitive uh, signals that are coming out of the uh, mouths uh, of other people, and so on. And, um, and there's one thing which is always present as you, as the actor, are interacting with the world, which is the actor itself. So it's really, really useful to set aside a couple of neurons and synapses which encode this representation of yourself, of yourself as you are interacting in many different ways uh, with, with the world. 
So as the com data compression of the entire history of your life is progressing, you are inventing all these little neural symbols which um, stand for the stuff that frequently occurs, which helps you to better compress, including your self symbols. Well, so you have symbols that stand for yourself. Now, whenever the controller is trying to solve a new problem by, um, by finding a, a weight matrix, a, a program essentially, um, that, that leads to an action sequence that solves that problem, it has a search space and it can reduce that search space by looking at this model um, which already knows a lot about the world and has algorithmic information about how the world works and you can reuse that in a good way to um, come up with new solutions more quickly and as it is doing that sometimes it's waking up these self symbols for example. Then you are thinking of yourself and our robots are thinking of themselves. They have self symbols which wake up just as a natural byproduct of data compression through um, during problem solving. And, um, and then of course what is happening as you cor correctly uh, stated some of the things that you, um, some, some of the skills and the observation sequences and the pattern recognition techniques that you have developed over the time, they become automatic. So they become kind of unconscious and uh, only the new things where you're still working on how to improve the performance of the controller, the problem solver, uh, they are still mm, undergoing a, a search process where you want to find a good combination of weights that uh, solve the, solves the new problem uh, without uh, destroying the previous skills that you have learned. And so our first system of that type, we really, I had one in 1991. It was a recurrent neural network. It just learned to compress the data, an unsupervised learning network, which learned to compress the observations. And, um, and everything that this guy didn't understand, it sent up to a, to a high-level guy. Mm, unpredictable stuff went up to a high-level guy, which then tried to find higher level irregularities and then <coughs> uh, maybe found additional compressibilities and developed internal representations, which the lower-level guy, the automatizer, as opposed to the conscious, conscious chunker, could learn to imitate such that the previously conscious stuff during problem solving and search became unconscious by imitating just the problems that the high level guy found. And so we have all of these things going on and have them had going on uh, and they have been going on for, for many years. So I would say from a technical and practical um, perspective, the issues of unsupervised learning and um, consciousness are solved and we already have them in our artificial beings. <laughs>